day. Um, excited about uh, speaking with you today. I have a couple of pictures I want you to look at first. Now, these are not just kind of abstract pieces of art. I don't know if any of you remember these pictures. They're called stereographs. Do you remember this like 20, 25 years ago? They had them in the malls here. And it's not just an abstract piece of art, but if you gaze at it for like 30 seconds, and if you just try to actually look through it with your eyes, it's actually a 3D picture of something else. It's not this. This is a picture of something else. So I want you to just gaze at it like, like you um, were just trying to stare someone down. If you just look at it, does anybody see it? It's like your, your brain's got to adjust to it. it. Takes a little while. It took me a long time to, to, I don't know what it is your brain does or your eyes do as you gaze at this, but it suddenly takes you, it's like stepping into 3D art, like into another dimension. Does anybody see it yet? Maybe it's a little different on this thing than it is even up here in our monitor. You know, try this one. Here's another one. Now the first one, I'll tell you what it was. This is three like tulips that are really big. I mean, just like the whole screen, not a little tulip, the whole screen, there's three tulips. Even if I tell you, you can't see it, right? Okay, look at, look at this one. This one's even more different if you look at it. I'll let you look at it just a second. This one's something really different. It's a big picture, the whole screen is it's a picture of something, not just one little part, but it's hidden in this. Anyone see it yet? It's difficult to see, isn't it? You can look them up later. I'll send them to you online even and let you look at them and uh, just try to do it. But this is actually the Statue of Liberty. And the whole thing, it's like the, from here up of the Statue of Liberty, right in the middle of it, you can see it there. Once you see it, you can't unsee it almost. It's like, okay, it takes you a minute to adjust it, but it looks like just an abstract piece of art. But hidden in this painting is a whole nother picture that you can't even see. If you, your eyes don't adjust, your mind doesn't allow you to step in this new dimension. And, and the reason, why do I show you this? I show you this because God's word is like this. God is like this. The gospel is like this. People, you, you tell people about Jesus and, and say, oh, okay, I understand. But even we don't fully understand all the dimensions of who God is, right? When we look at his word, it's suddenly, sometimes it's like something just pops out off the pages and God speaks to us. It's like you enter into, wow, I hear God's voice speaking through his word. Or I see something I've never seen. I've known this verse for 10 years. And all of a sudden I see something I've never seen in it. In the same way, this picture kind of does that. And I believe that God's, uh, God's word, the gospel, Jesus himself, what Jesus has done for us on the cross, is, is just like that. If we don't gaze at it and really look and say, really not just with our own physical eyes, but with spiritual eyes, and say, God, I can't see it. I can't see you for who you are. Then we can't see it. But if, if God, by his spirit, opens our eyes, it's like we see, ah, oh, I understand who Jesus is now. I understand his word now. It's by the power of the spirit that God enables us. Uh, and so I want to share, share with you something I think is one of the most important truths about the Christian life. The gospel is a mystery and it's really kind of hidden. 
And God says people's eyes are blinded by, we're, our eyes are blinded by our own sinfulness. So let's read this together. It says, the mystery hidden for ages. Will you read it with me? One, two, three. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known the great, how great among the Gentiles are the riches of his glory. This mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the title of what I'll be teaching on today. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what this mystery is of the gospel. So let's pray together and ask God that you would open our eyes, open our hearts to who he is. Father God, we thank you that you have given us your spirit, that you've given us your word. And yet, God, we confess that apart from you, we can't even see who you are. We can't hear your voice. We can't understand. We don't even say, see our own sinfulness, Father, unless your spirit convicts us and reveals it. And so, God, we come to you as your children today, asking that you would open our eyes, open our hearts to see you for who you are, and that we would be changed, Father, as we step into another dimension, this supernatural life that you have promised us, Father. So I ask God that you would speak to us, that you would reveal yourself to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is the hope of glory? Hope of glory. Uh, another, another way of saying this is uh, it's, it's like what we all long for. We, we long to be successful. We long for to be happy. The hope of our success in life, of making it in life, our hope is Christ in us, living in us. This is the mystery, and this is what Paul uh, prayed for the, uh, for the Colossians there. He says that, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Now listen to this. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus Christ himself are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And don't you want to know those treasure, that treasure, that hidden treasure? It's like God wants us to go on a treasure hunt, to seek him so that we can see him. This is Paul's prayer, and this is our prayer. And so what I want us to look at is, what does it mean that Christ is in us? You know, if you feel like the Christian life is easy, then this is for you. This is, this is not for you. But if you feel like, you know, I just can't. I just can't forgive that person. I just can't um, love that person the way I need to love them. You know, I can't resist temptation like I know I should. If you struggle with things like I struggle with things, this is for you today. Because the Christian life isn't just a difficult life to live. It's impossible. It's impossible for us to live the Christian life in our own strength, in our own power. And so what, what I want to do is I want us to look at Jesus' life, how Jesus lived his life. Because what he did, he lived his life in a way as a model to us of how we are to live in total dependence on God. Jesus' life just wasn't here to, to do miracles and to die on the cross, and, but he was actually modeling how we are to live our lives in dependence on God the Father. Look at this. He, Jesus says in five, John 5, 19, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord. Is that true? The Son, Jesus himself, couldn't do anything on his own will? You think, well, he was Jesus. He could do anything. Jesus himself says, I couldn't do anything on my own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. That's very interesting. You, you wonder, you know, Jesus walks up to the pool with all these people that are sick or crippled or have 
all kinds of diseases, and Jesus heals one person. You think, wow, why did he just heal one person? Because the Father only wanted to heal one person. He couldn't just go in there and do whatever he wanted to. He was demonstrating his dependence, his connection with his Father, and how we should live as well. Here's another verse. I can do nothing on my own. This is from the same uh, John 5. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Wow. He can do nothing on his own. And then again, in this same passage, he says, oh, is this the same verse above? It's supposed to be the, the you, you know the John 5 passage that says, uh, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. And Jesus was demonstrating to us how we should live the Christian life in total dependence on God every moment of our lives. Now, last week I talked about the resurrection life and what it, what it means uh, for, for, for us to receive this new resurrected life in Jesus. And I, I want to come back to that because it's, it's, it relates to this as well. You know, um, Jesus, now this sounds kind of weird. Why did Jesus come to earth? Well, you, we naturally think, well, he came to, to die for our sins. But is that why Jesus really came to earth, just to die for our sins? I would suggest that Jesus came to restore our relationship with God. And in order to do that, he had to die for our sins. So his death on the cross was the means to the end. Because Jesus said what he said, I have come to give you life. That's why he came. He came to give us life. And the only way he could give us life is to die on the cross for our sins. So his death on the cross is not the end all. And it says here in Romans 5, some of what I said last week, it says, since then, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more, much more than being justified by his blood. Shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if when we were, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We were enemies, and God still loved us and reconciled to us by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved through his life. In, in Romans 5 here, it says several times, it says much more, more than this. I think it's like five different times Paul says, more than this, even more than this, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That was God's purpose in coming to this world, is to reconcile us to himself, to restore the relationship that was lost in the garden with Adam. Here's another passage from this uh, Romans 5. It says, For if... Because of one man's sin, death reigned through that, one, through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. God wants us to reign in life. This was the, this was the mandate given in Genesis 1, right? Be fruitful, multiply, and subdue the earth. God wants us to reign in life, in the things that he's given us authority over. Whether it's our, the work that we do, the families that we are raising, everything that God uh, has given us to do. It says in Romans 6, it says, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too, might walk in the newness of life. So that was God's purpose in Jesus coming to earth. It was not just to die for our sins, but to give us new life by restoring our relationship to Him.
You know, it's like, it's like uh, my wife and daughter are right now at a concert in Nashville. And they bought their tickets. They bought their tickets a month ago online. They watched the concert. And they got the tickets. They, they can go. But right now they are at the concert. That's why they bought the ticket, right? To go to the concert. In the same way, God bought us not to just say, okay, I'm safe now. I'll wait till I one day go to heaven. No, he wants us to enjoy the full and meaningful life, the abundant life that he has promised us right now here on earth. It doesn't mean that we won't have problems. It doesn't mean that we won't sin. But it means that we will have and experience supernatural life by walking in the power of the Spirit. Now, how do we do that? What does that look like? We know that Jesus lives in us, and it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, if anyone is in Christ, and we usually think of that as, well, we are in Christ, and because we are in Christ, when God looks at you as a believer, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see all your mistakes and your flaws. He sees Jesus because we are hidden in Christ. But the other part of that is that Christ is in us as well. His Holy Spirit, when we receive Christ, the Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead came to live in our hearts and make our hearts, our bodies, his home. I would compare it, what it, what it could look like is, is something like what God has shown us through nature. Now, man is different than every other living creature, right? We have, it says that God breathed his, his spirit. But isn't it interesting what God has done through nature? He has put what we call instinct in animals. And they know how to do things. No one taught them. They know to fly in formation. And we just found out several years ago why they do it. They actually rotate. You know, the first bird takes the hardest wind, and the, and the farther back you are, the wind uh, factor is, is less. And so they actually rotate leaders. Who taught them how to do that? No one. It's their instinct. It's something that God gave them. Bees, how do they make the perfect little, what is that? A, I can't remember. Is that a, the sides? How many sides? Octagon? Hexagon. Hexagon. How do they know how to make a hexagon? I can't draw a good one. And there they have made it with their mouths somehow. Unbelievable what God has done in his creation in nature. Salmon. Unbelievable what salmon do. They get, they, they're born upstream and they, they swim all downstream their whole life. And then when it's time to look for them to lay eggs, they swim back upstream hundreds of miles. And they go to their birthplace. Look at them jumping to the, trying to get up the stream to go and back to their birthplace to lay eggs. Amazing. How do they know? <coughs> Birds. How do they know to build? Look at that nest. I couldn't make that out of grass. I couldn't make it especially out of grass with my mouth. No hands allowed, you know. <coughs> Unbelievable what God has done in creation. And initially, God had given Adam his spirit, which was more than just a, a program, like an instinct that we would know what to do. It was a relationship with God. And so man, without the Holy Spirit, is like an animal without its instinct. <clears throat> Think about birds. If they didn't know to fly south, why did they fly? If they just didn't know that, what would happen to the bird? They would die, right? They'd freeze to death. Or the salmon wouldn't reproduce. Or the, the bird would have nowhere to lay its eggs that would be safe. They would die. They, it would self-destruct, right? Because they don't know. In the same way, man without the Holy Spirit, because of our sin, 
we tend toward self-destruction, right? We see it all around us. We see it ourselves. We are our own biggest problem, right? Our own self-discipline. I want to do this. I just don't do it. I just can't do it. I keep failing at my sin. People get addicted to things. And we just walk down that path to self-destruction because the wages of sin is death. Death in relationships, death physically in our bodies, and ultimately death to our souls. So why did Jesus come? He came to put his spirit back in us so that our eyes could be opened to what is true and what is not. What is lies and what is true. And when our eyes are opened and we are empowered by the Spirit of God, we can walk away from self-destruction, walk away from sin, and experience newness of life. I like this, this verse in Romans 11.36. It says, From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. I love this verse. And you know, we all know as we go through life that, that everything we have comes from God as, as believers. We know that. Yes, God, I am, I've given, been given everything uh, from you. I acknowledge that. I'm thankful for it. We even know that everything that we do is to, to be for God's glory, right? Everything we do, God wants us to glorify him with our lives. But what we often forget is this here, through him. We can't do anything unless it is through him. You look at Jesus' life and it's just amazing. Everything he did was successful. Isn't that amazing? He, he, he fed 5,000. He prayed for people and they were healed. He walked on water. He quieted the sea because, the, because the, his father, his heavenly father was working through him and he was perfectly obedient to God the Father and dependent on him for everything. Can you imagine if we walked in the power of the Spirit every day? I can't, I, I can't do it, right? We can't do it. We can't even live our lives apart from what God, uh, with God's Spirit in us. But this is the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus has already done everything. It's not like we have to try to do certain things to earn God's favor anymore. The gospel is that Jesus has lived the perfect life, that he has given us his spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God is now living in us. We are totally accepted. We're fully loved and fully pleasing to God because we are his children. And now, he says, depend on me. Listen to my voice. I will direct your path. I will direct your steps. Everything that he tells us to do, we can do it because we have his Holy Spirit living in us. How do we do that? How do we tap into this? And I think one of the keys is right here in 2 Peter. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His glory, He's called us to His glory and the excellence by which He granted to us, here it is, His precious and very great promises, so that through them you might become partakers in of the divine nature. We can partake in the divine nature of having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of the sinful desire. So how do we partake of this divine, supernatural, Holy Spirit living, abundant life? It's through his great and precious promises. As we read his word, and God says, I'll provide for you. 
I will provide for you. You don't have to worry. Then we say, okay, God, thank you. I'm not an orphan. I'm your child. You have promised me that you will take care of, care of me, that you will provide for me. I don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> if we're afraid, if we're afraid of something, we say, God says, do not fear. I am with you. He is with us. It's like if you, if you, uh, if you went out into battle and had nothing on, <clears throat> it would be pretty scary. People shooting at you, and that's the way it is in the world sometimes. We walk into the world, different temptations come at us, uh, people say things that hurt our feelings, these bullets are coming at us all day long. But if we are in a tank, if we have a shield of faith, if we have the sword of the Spirit around us, God is saying, I'm with you. I will protect you. I have, I've given you everything you need. You can walk out into the world every day in victory because I am with you. I am in you and with you and for you. And I have a plan for you. I have a plan for your life. If I don't know what to do next. God wants us to take one step at a time and say, okay, God, I'll trust you. I don't know what to do, but I know what to do today. I don't know what to do tomorrow or next week, but I know what you want me to do today. And step by step, he leads us because he wants us to be dependent on him, right? <clears throat> Another way of looking at this supernatural life is like a lantern. And in a lantern, uh, <clears throat> the old-timey lanterns, you don't see these very much anymore, they had these wicks, right? You have the wick, and you that, stick the wick in there, and you roll it in there, and then you light it. If you just light the wick, how long will that wick burn? Not very long, <clears throat> right? If it's just the wick, as it is right there in the picture, it's, it's going to burn out pretty fast, just a few minutes. But what allows that wick to continue to burn and burn and burn is the oil. <clears throat> As it absorbs the oil into the wick, you light the fire and that thing will burn and burn and burn, shining its light for a long, long time. If you're tired and say, I can't live the Christian life, you know, maybe God's saying, well, good. You're not supposed to live the Christian life. I am supposed to live the Christian life through you. You can't. We can't live the Christian life in our own power. It's impossible. But by the power of his spirit, through his promises, we can do it. We can obey the things that he commands us to do. Just to give you a how-to and how the, what this looks like. How do we participate in this divine nature and experience the life that God has promised us? The way we do it, now, the, the living the Christian life is not a formula. It's like, okay, one, two, three. But I want to give you some a way of thinking about this. I don't want to just throw it out there and say, okay, Go, you, there's somehow we do this. Here's a way to allow God and to embrace and submit to the Holy Spirit. It's first just in prayer say, God, I can't forgive this person. I cannot do this in my own power. I just admit that apart from you, I can do nothing. And I submit myself to you. I, I'm unable to do it because because I'm a sinful person. So this is kind of the first thing we do, is just say, when we come up against something, we say, there's just no way I can forgive this person. There's no way I can share my faith with that person. I'm scared to death. Just admit it. Say, yes, God, you're right. I can't. And then the second thing we would do is say, but thank you, God, that you have given me everything I need to do what you have commanded me to do through your great and precious promises and by the Spirit 
that you have given me, I can forgive this person. I can love this person. I can share my faith. I can uh, love one of my coworkers at work that I work next to or my, uh, for missionaries, you know, missionaries, one of the main reasons that missionaries go back to their home country is because they can't get along with other missionaries. Isn't that sad? <laughs> that's really sad. Missionaries fight among ourselves. It's like, that's crazy. But that's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to fight among ourselves in your own family. He wants you to fight, your husband and wife to fight each other. Say, God, I can't love my wife. I can't love my husband the way I'm supposed to. But thank you, God. You've given me my, your spirit. And then what do you do when you say, thank you, God? Thank you is an, acknowledge, is, a, is an acknowledgement of faith that God is going to do it. He can do it and he will do it if we yield our hands, our feet, our mouths, our bodies to him. And then we say, God, in faith, I'm going to step out and obey what you've asked me to do. I'm going to love my spouse today, even though I don't feel like it. Even though I don't feel like forgiving this person, I'm going to forgive this person and I'm going to treat them in a way that shows that I've forgiven them, even if I don't feel like it. But the problem with us is we kind of hesitate and we say, I'm going to wait. I don't really feel like it today. I don't feel like I'm, I can't, I can't do it. I'm too angry. I feel uh, very hurt by this person. I can't forgive them. And so when, I know when God works in my heart, really works in my heart, I'll feel love toward that person or I'll feel forgiven. But God doesn't say that. He doesn't say, wait till you feel, feel good about it. Wait till you feel uh, ready to do it and then step out and then you know, you'll have the feelings to back it up. The Christian life is a life of faith that we step out and we do what God has asked us to do even if we don't feel like it. And it's just like when Joshua crossed over into the promised land. It's, it's more like that when Joshua had to walk out into the water before the waters parted in the Jordan River, right? Do you remember that? He had to walk out in the water before it parted. With Moses, it parted before they went. And sometimes God does that. Sometimes God parts the water and says, okay, you can go now. And you feel better about it. But sometimes, and I would say usually, he wants us to go the Joshua route. Well, there's water there. I don't think this is going to happen like it did with Moses. And when we step out and say, I forgive that person. I'm going to share my faith with that person. I'm going to love my coworker. I'm going to love my teammate. I'm going to love my spouse. Then the feelings come later. And we are able to experience the supernatural life of God working in and through us. I'll give you a couple of examples and then we'll close up. I remember when I was praying about coming to Thailand. I didn't know what to do. I knew I wanted to come to Thailand and God had put that desire in my heart, but I had all these things come against me. I've, I've shared this before, but like I was dating a girl who didn't want to go overseas. I'm like, oh man, she wanted to break up with my girlfriend. My parents weren't very excited about me going to the other side of the world. Well, Greg, you know, you've got a good job. My boss gave me a promotion. And my pastor said, well, you need to go to seminary first, and then maybe in five or six years, you am like, okay, wow, I don't know what to do. But I really sensed God working and saying, I want you to go now. And I prayed and fasted one day, said, God, I'll just do anything. I can't, I don't know what to do. And the next morning, I woke up and God said, why wouldn't you go? It was almost like an audible voice. Why wouldn't you go? And I said, well, my girlfriend, the pastor says I should go to seminary. My, my boss is giving me a promotion. My, you know, it was like, but he's given me the desire. He's asked me to go. God went straight to my idol of approval. I like for other people to, to approve of what I do. And he's saying, no, I want you to do what I want you to do and step out. So I went in that day and I said, okay, I told my boss, I'm, I'm going to 
resign. And he said, well, will you stay with us three more months to help us train some months? And sure. So, but once I stepped out, I'm like, God, how am I going to do this? I've got to raise support. I don't know how I'm going to get moved and get training. I don't know what my parents are going to do. As soon as I stepped out and said, okay, I quit my job, I was scared. I was scared to death. A friend of mine called and said, hey, my parents live right behind the training, the church that does your training. They've got a downstairs apartment. You can live there for free. I'm like, okay, wow, a free place to live, just like that. One of my coworkers came up and said, man, I'm really encouraged. I want to support you. And going to Thailand, it's like, wow, I've already started raising support. I didn't even have to ask anybody. My parents called a week later and said, you know, Greg, we don't understand this, but it scares us to think that we may be standing in the way of what God wants for your life. And so if you really feel like God wants you to do this, we want you to go. It's like, oh my goodness. The doors just opened up when I took that one step. I would have never seen all those things happen if I had just waited for the doors to open and then tried to, God just open it up, just step out into the water. And God did it. That's an example 30 years ago. Example even today. I would say this every time I get up to speak here. I say, God, I, I don't know what to say. I, I can't. I can't preach today. I can't teach. Today. I don't know if I can do this. I'm tired. I don't, I don't feel prepared. But thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that's in me. And so I'm not going to leave the church and go home. <laughs> before I'm going to step out and stand up here in faith and ask God to speak through me to you. So praise the Lord. I don't know what you are approaching or facing today that maybe you've been hesitant. I don't know if you're, you're not really experiencing this glory, the hope of glory that we all yearn to experience of a supernatural life of God living and working in and through us, making us more like the Lord Jesus. But I hope that now maybe you can look at the cross and like those pictures I showed you at the beginning, maybe you see another dimension. You see the supernatural life. You see the glory of who Jesus is. You see the glory of what he has done on the cross for you. Not just to forgive you for your sins, but to reconcile you to himself that he could live his supernatural life in and through you. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your presence with us. God, we thank you that we have been given everything we need for life and godliness through your great and precious promises. God, teach us how to live this supernatural life we confess that we cannot do it alone, apart from you, Father. So we yield ourselves to you afresh today and say, fill us up. Pour in your Holy Spirit. Help us not to wait for feelings, but to step out in faith in what you have for us in relationships in projects and different things you want us to do in sharing our faith in our business in our work every day thank you for your Holy Spirit God alive in us in Jesus name we pray Amen